Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for Digital Globe's LEAD webinar series, Learn, Engage, Act, and Discover. My name is Becky Schneider and I'm the Marketing Programs Manager at Digital Globe. Before we get started, here's a few tips to keep in mind while viewing today's presentation. All attendees are on mute. To ask a question, please use the Q&A chat box feature that is located at the right-hand side of your screen. All questions will be answered at the end of today's webinar. A link to today's webinar recording will be sent to everyone via email within the next 48 hours. Today's technical webinar titled Satellite Derived Bathymetry, Methods and Results, will demonstrate satellite-based technology delivered at Digital Globe to determine water depth in shallow coastal environments. The presentation will highlight capabilities and limitations learned from numerous validation results by comparing depths derived from Digital Globe's Worldview 2 imagery with LIDAR and acoustic data. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Gregory Mesnick. Gregory joined Digital Globe in 2009 and currently serves as the principal scientist with Digital Globe Labs with his focus on shallow water bathymetry. Gregory received his PhD in atomic physics at the University of Lund, Sweden in 1993. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Gregory and let's begin today's webinar. Thank you, Becky, for the introduction and welcome everybody. Let me start with a review of our product from the technology point of view. Uh, the product has three components, uh, water depth, water quality, and bottom type. Uh, the table illustrates various uh, type of accuracy associated with each product. Uh, the second column shows the horizontal resolution, and for all products we deliver in native uh, satellite resolution, uh, which is provided to the user at two meters uh, in X and Y directions. The vertical resolution for the water depth, the maximum resolution is about 10%, although it varies strongly with the uh, benthic habitat, especially water properties. Uh, in regard to water quality, we provide the entire water column and it's not applicable for bottom type classification. The maximum depth for different products varies as follows. Uh, for very bright clear water sand, uh, in clear waters, the maximum penetration depth is about 20 to 30 meters. By penetration depth, I mean this is the maximum depth at, at which we can distinguish a bright object. Uh, for seagrass and algae, which are darker objects, we can only penetrate down to approximately 15 meters, although it varies strongly with the water uh, clarity. For the water quality, uh, we can typically penetrate 20 to 30 meters or even sometimes only 5 meters for very turbid water. Now, in regard to classification, we can probably classify down to about 20 meters over relatively bright targets and probably about 15 meters for uh, differentiation between seagrass and algae. But it has to be really clear water. Now, in terms of accuracy, the uh, RMS error uh, is about 10 to 15 percent of the actual water depth over sand, and again, it's in clear waters. For clear waters over sea grasses and algae or rocks, it's probably more in about 15 to 20 percent range of the actual water depth. So the absolute error does increase with the water depth. Now, in regard to the water quality, we have only performed visual assessment. And with regard to bottom dike classification, we can distinguish uh, sediments such as sand from seagrass, coral, or an algae. Here is an example of what a product can look like. This is an example which we uh, performed over Northern Ireland for a small uh, port in Wexford. And the colors red through green and blue illustrate the actual measured depth. The red is shallow, uh, green is probably about 10 meters, and um, blue is probably 15 meters on this chart. 
And this is a uh, well V2 imagery draped with the imagery of the water depth. Another presentation of bottom types can be done using a geotiff, for instance, classification or presentation. And this image shows uh, composition from coral, seagrass, and very bright sand uh, as measured in Listocking Islands in the Bahamas. Now, the accuracy of our product depends strongly upon the sensor characterization and upon the accuracy of the sensor itself. And all results presented here pertain to measurements from the World V2 sensor. Now, the World V2 sensor uh, belongs to uh, what we call a World V class of sensors. And it has eight uh, multispectral bands, uh, relatively wide at about 50 nanometers resolution, and it has one uh, very broad panchromatic band. The presence of eight spectral bands, which range in wavelength range from about 400 to about 900 nanometers, allow us to differentiate various constituents in the bottom, as well as to differentiate, better differentiate a water depth than using previous sensors, such as Iconos or Quidbert, uh, which only have four bands. Another important characteristic of a sensor which needs to be considered if this type of a status is the pointing accuracy and the horizontal accuracy. The current accuracy of World V class sensor is about 2.5 meters. And this chart shows the spread of errors as measured with ground control points. And as you can see, there isn't really much bias, and the spread is confined uh, with RMS errors of about 4.4 uh, panchromatic pixels, which translates into about 2.2 meters. Another important characteristic is the agility of our sensor, ability to turn very quickly and take a snapshot in one instance in uh, take a snapshot of the same object at instances that differ only by a few seconds. The next set of slides illustrates acquisition over a campus in NGA acquired from WorldV2 uh, with the difference in imagery at about probably 10, 15 seconds. And if you look closer at the image, you can see the building's tilting as the sensor moves forward and the car is moving. This is a very important technological aspect which allows us to use uh, wave kinematics also to derive a water depth, and I will talk about it shortly. Let's talk about the status of today retrievals, uh, which we performed here at Digital Globe. We have available for share with everybody a compendium a very comprehensive study which shows how we validated the accuracy of our product. The document contains uh, validation from five different sites and contains about 100 pages. What I'm going to show here are probably about 10 pages that illustrate the most important aspect of these documents. And I welcome everybody to send email to us and request a copy of the compendium. So here is the location of validation sites. Uh, because of local interest and clarity of the water and also access to uh, ground truth data, uh, we have decided to perform extensive validation in the Bahamas and Caribbean regions. The five sites on your right-hand side illustrate the currently validated sites, uh, which are Bahamas West End, Princess Keys, Listokin Islands, Puerto Rico, and St. Croix. And the sites on the left are future validation sites. Let's take a look at the accuracy achieved over these talking islands. What I'm showing here is a World V2 image with uh, rectang red rectangles showing the position of uh, data, the ground truth data, available for us for validation. The ground truth data was uh, obtained in 2002. It's about eight years old relative to the World V2 acquisition. And the red boxes show the extent of the actual data. 
So this is where we perform the validation. This chart illustrates the characteristic of our errors. The left side, the spread charts, shows position of every single pixel retrieved from worldview2 imagery, and the actual depths are on the y-axis. Now, the x-axis shows the depth of the multi-beam sander or single-beam sander, as it was in this case. And the depth increase going to the right with the ground troop and going up with the world v2 derived bottom depth. The number of points for this particular acquisition was about 40,000, and the overall accuracy is about 1.3 meters. Now, the right plot shows distribution of the different depths measured with our sensor and measured with multi-beam sounding. Let's go to the next site, uh, which is about 500 kilometers to the north of Listokin Islands, and this is the major island on the Bahamas. The left chart shows uh, azimuth plot in elevation and uh, position of our satellite and the sun. This is a very important consideration for World V2 tasking to avoid sunglint. In most cases, we would like to be in the direction behind the sun so as to minimize the sunglint. The right side shows our World V2 image uh, with faint tracks uh, of uh, multi-beam, of single-beam sounders. And the tracks extend to relatively deep areas on the south side of the island and very shallow areas on the north side of the island. On this chart, I'm showing very similar results to what I did for Listokin Island. Again, the left-hand left side shows the spread points of our measurements. Uh, we collected about, there was about 7,000 points provided to us for validation. Uh, the ground truth data extends uh, all the way to about 18 meters. And the collective RMS error for all the points is about one meter. So it typically translates into probably anywhere from about 5% to 15% of the actual depth. What is important to realize is that the errors do increase with the, uh, the water depth. Uh, the right charts, again, show distribution of the points, and statistically there is a very good agreement. Now, the next site, uh, which is the Princess Keys, it's a very uh, beautiful place in the Bahamas region, too. And um, the left-hand side, again, shows the relative position of our satellite and the sun. For this particular case, we had access to about four images. We picked the, the best one. And uh, the right-hand side shows our imagery. And it illustrates the richness of the envi environment. This is sand. Um, and with sparsely and densely populated vegetation, with ranges going all the way from zero close to the shoreline down to more than 30 meters. Now, we performed a validation for Princess Keys with uh, multi-beam sounder data provided to us from United Kingdom Hydrographic Office. The data covered about two, uh, one quarter of a million of pixels, about 250,000. And the overall accuracy is about uh, anyway from 0 to, to 30 meters. The overall accuracy is about 1 meter. Again, it does increase the, with the water depth. So at 25 meters, it's probably 15% in this case. At uh, 10 meters depth, it's probably as good as even 5%. And again, the right-hand side shows the statistical distribution of the points. Let's go to Puerto Rico. Now, all the areas which I presented so far uh, are, could be characterized as very clear and pristine environments. The water clarity is very good. There is very little uh, chlorophyll, uh, sedum, or suspended particles. Well, it wasn't the case for Puerto Rico, where we had to deal, first of all, with sand lint, uh, which we saw in tiles 1, 6, and 7. And also, the water clarity was questionable in tiles uh, labeled 3, 4, and 5 in this chart. There was a lot of absorption from sedum and probably resuspended particles. 
again, the accuracy wasn't as good. And I'm showing here results from what I would call intermediate case, uh, which contains a little bit of uh, CDOM and suspended particles. Uh, the accuracy here is about uh, 1.8 RMS error uh, measured from between 0 and 13, 14 meters. The spread is larger, as we could see before, partly because of sanglint and partly because of the more turbid water, as we saw before. Now, the right-hand side illustrates the statistical distribution of the points. It is good, but definitely worse than shown previously. And the compendium illustrates results for, all this, for every single tile, uh, which are shown before, and the user can actually get a feeling of how the accuracy degrades with degraded water quality. We also performed analysis of St. Croix. For this case, uh, we were facing with a very high sanglint, uh, which was not corrected in the imagery, as we just wanted to show the effect of what the sanglint can do for the retrievals. Now, this is a very pristine, relatively clear water, a relatively shallow. The depth goes between uh, zero and probably, on average, maybe 20 meters. In contrast to the other sites, it's dominated by a relatively rich coral, which we did not see in Bahamas West End, neither in Listokin Islands. For this specific case, there is a larger spread of data, and it's mainly attributed to the sanglint. And, um, but nonetheless, the overall RMS error is 1.6 meters for cumulative depths all the way from 0 to 25 meters. So it's probably in a ballpark of about 10 to 15 percent. And the statistical distribution of the points shows there is a very good match uh, with one or two exceptions. Let's take a look at the uh, current retrieval methods. How do we do it? Well, the fundamental principle behind our uh, Digital Globe product is based on the interaction, the physical interaction of light with water and the atmosphere. So the current retrieval algorithm explores relationship between the top of the atmosphere radiance and all basic parameters which affect the, uh, the uh, reflectance. And these parameters are water depth, water IOP, which are um, abbreviated as uh, inherent optical properties, and these are the chlorophyll, um, color dissolved organic matter, also known as sedum, and suspended particles, as well as the bottom reflectance. These three parameters are interwoven in our method, and the bathymetric product actually provides information about these three, uh, three types of parameters. Now, the very first step in the retrieval process is conversion from top of the atmosphere radiances to the above water reflectances, also known as remote sensing reflectance. To that end, we compute the aerosol optical depth, and we compute not using any in situ measurements. This is, this is a fully autonomous process, and which does not rely on any in situ external measurements. The only thing that has been used is the imagery. The next step is um, generation of so-called lookup tables, which, to save the time, store information about remote sensing reflectance computed at discrete parameters, such as discrete values of depth, water IOP, and uh, reflectances. Now, in order to compute the, uh, the lookup tables, we try to get as good match between bottom reflectances as water clarity for a given aquatic environment as we can. If the data is available from the specific site, we would use it. If the data is not available, we'll try to use generic uh, libraries. Now, and the last step is the parameter retrieval. So once we know uh, the remote sensing reflectance for every pixel, once we have a lookup tables uh, which describe the water sen sensing reflectance as a function of water depth, 
uh, water properties and bottom pipe, we can compute the norm or the difference between the known and the unknown remote sensitive reflectances. And by, by minimizing the difference, we can estimate the parameters, such as the depth. Now, this is a well-known process, and it's typically called a spectral matching. And as you could see, the errors are relatively good, given the fact that we're looking at the water from about 800 kilometers, and yet we can derive a water depth with accuracy of about one meter. Nonetheless, there are errors, and we would like to get rid or minimize the errors. So the question becomes, well, given the sensor, how can we minimize the errors? The Wolfe 2 class sensor belongs to the class known as electro-optical sensors. And our core technology, uh, which is what I presented, it, it's based on the spectral domain of the measurements, and it relies on radiometric spectral matching. Now, in spatial resolution as the image pixels, and I showed in the first slide that we provide the product at two meter resolution. Now, the, one has to be aware, however, that while this product is, uh, has very high spatial resolution, it is prone to errors due to the aerosols, uh, which drive the errors in remote sensing reflectance. It is prone to water turbidity and unknown habitat. So currently, this is our core technology, and the results that I presented so far are based on this uh, spectral domain matching or spectral matching. Now, with electrical optical sensors such as WorldV2, we can also look into the, we can also utilize multiple pairs, also known as stereo pairs, and the, um, the fundamental approach is based on the photogrammetric uh, triangulation. Uh, the multiple views from different angles will provide information about the water depth in the same way as multiple views from different angles provide information about height of a building, with the exception of refraction through the water. Now, the spatial resolution for this technology is going to be multiple pixels, and it will depend strongly on the on texture. Now, this product or this technology will be prone to errors over very smooth surfaces, for instance, featureless sandbanks. However, this product will not depend upon the atmospheric compensation Therefore, we don't really need to know the aerosol content, or we don't even need to derive the remote sensing reflectance. And also, it's going to be resilient to the poor knowledge of the habitat. And we are currently developing this technology and probably should be the first assessment of the errors should be available by the end of this year. And the last piece of technology which is achievable with our sensors due to high agility an ability to collect uh, images at frequent intervals down to about six seconds uh, is based on wave kinematics. This approach has existed in literature for about 20 to 30 years, but only recently has proven to um, have really good accuracy of about one meters. Now, the, the only problem with this approach is that spatial resolution is about 100 meters. However, compared with the other approaches, it will work great in all water types. So it will, it will work in ports, in uh, river mouths, and in all places where we cannot see the bottom. However, it does require wave motion. And this is an existing technology which hopefully will be added in the future to a digital globe uh, solution. Now, another important aspect to realize in bathymetric studies is the noise factor. This is an example of an image which we collected in northern in, in Norway at about 80 degrees latitude north. And the small chart illustrates signal to noise ratio, which is a ratio of a signal of a measurable signal to the anticipated noise, and this is signal to noise ratio in a reflectance space. As you can see in our coastal and blue bands, which penetrate deepest, the sensor noise is only about 15 or 30, and it's maybe about 45 in the, blue, in the uh, green band. So to anybody who has experienced uh, 
with remote sensing, they will know that this is a very, very small number to work with. The big question is how can we improve it? Well, the standard well VT collections are performed with nominal um, integration time on board of a processor. So every single uh, chip uh, collects photons and uh, the integration time uh, is fixed, although it does depend on the type of the scene. However, the integration time is specifically tuned to land scenes. And it is not ideally suited for water scenes, which are typically much darker than land. However, we can increase and boost the signal-to-noise ratio through customized collections, through the decreased scan rate and increased integration time. And if we factor in both components, we can achieve a 16, per, a 16 times improvement in digital numbers, which translates into a four-time increase in the uh, signal-to-noise ratio. So in the previous chart, on average, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio was about 30. And if we use a four-time increase, it's going to be about 120. And the retrieval quality will be much better. Now, one caution here. The collection parameters have to be tuned to a given scene in order to avoid saturation. Now, another important aspect for improvement of our product quality is collaboration. Uh, we try to engage with various scientists and institutions, not only to validate our data, not only to sell our data, but also improve the quality of a product. After all, this type of technology has existed in the open literature for probably more than 15 years, yet our sensor has been on board for only about four years. So uh, we are engaged with partnerships with NOAA, uh, the Center of Coastal Monitoring and Assessment, and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. We engage with them for the validation. And the sites in Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico and St. Croix were, were validated with help uh, from NOAA. Uh, with Naval Research Lab at Stennis, we perform uh, the algorithm improvement and validation. We also work with uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, also known as CSIRO, which is based in Australia. We work on development, and hopefully in the future we'll be working on extensive validation. Uh, in Australia, we also have partnerships with Queensland University uh, with the Biophysical Remote Sensing Group for validation over uh, Great Barrier Reef and uh, areas close to uh, Brisbane. Uh, with the University of Massachusetts in Boston, we work on algorithm development, as well as we work with Sequoia Scientific Incorporation, who provided us uh, Hydrolyte software, uh, which is the underlying software for simulation of, uh, for radiated transient simulation in water. Uh, we work with them on development. Uh, we also work with J Omega, a uh, small company for wave kinematics. And um, we also have partnerships, uh, which I will mention in uh, just a moment. So to conclude my talk, uh, I have three bullets which really emphasize where we currently are. So our technology is accurate to about 10 to 15 percent of the actual depth over clear and sandy areas and about 15 to 20 percent over dark areas. Now, these numbers are only approximate, and there is not a single number that can represent accuracy of satellite-derived bathymetry. Nonetheless, uh, the charts which I prevent, presented so far and also included in the compendium hopefully shed more light on the actual validation and on the actual numbers. Now, the, we have established a roadmark, uh, roadmap towards better accuracy. And we are going in the near future to add, add segmentation information which um, explores texture of the image in order to classify the bottom type. Most importantly, we are going to add in the near future the stereo approach. So the question becomes how to get access to this technology. Well, we can get, you can get access directly from DigiGlobe by contacting us, or you can also get access to uh, our partners, Proteus. 
And the next set of slides talk about the achievements of uh, Proteus, who performed uh, bathymetric studies using our imagery. And uh, Proteus is currently our partner in derivation and also in selling of uh, bathymetric product. This is an example which uh, Proteus did over uh, Northern Ireland for Wexford. It shows a water quality map. Uh, this was a small area, uh, very similar to which I showed before. Uh, the area was relatively clear in deeper waters. However, as you get closer to inland, uh, to, to the mouth of the river, the water quality becomes uh, turbid. Uh, why am I showing this? Because on the next slide, um, you're going to see the degraded performance. And the performance degrades very uh, directly with the performing water clarity. So this is a chart that shows uh, the results, uh, how the data derived proteus compared with the actual water depth uh, from multi-beam sander. The accuracy in the middle of the image is about uh, below one meter. Uh, as you go deeper to the right, uh, more towards the green, it shows accuracy of about uh, two, two, three meters, uh, which is about 10 to 20 percent of the actual water depth. And as you go left in the image, uh, the, the, water degra uh, the water clarity gets worse and also the performance degrades. And again, uh, this chart illustrates um, how can we get access, how can you get access to uh, our data, our technology through Proteus. And I believe this concludes my talk, and I'm open for questions. So thank you, Gregory, for your formative presentation. At this time, we'll now open the Q&A portion of today's webinar for all the attendees. Please remember that the attendees are on mute. So to submit a question to Gregory, please use the Q&A chat box feature that's located at the right-hand side of the screen. I'll give everyone just a couple of moments to begin typing in your questions for today's speaker. So Gregory, I have your first question for today, and they're asking, what is the principal mathematic relationship that you use when derived of a symmetry from the imagery? The principal mathematic relationship is based on an optimal estimation theory. And uh, this process has been published and well explored for atmospheric research uh, by Cliff Rogers. Uh, who is currently in, uh, in England. He was working at NCAR in Colorado. And he explores relationship between measurements, accuracy of the actual measurements, as well as any other additional information. The additional information can be the a priori knowledge on the environment, can be any set of other measurements. And optimal estimation, uh, which is currently embedded in our software, allow us to combine spectral measurements with, measurement, with stereo-based measurements as well as with wave kinematic measurements. And um, I'm not quite sure if that fully explains uh, within one or two minutes allocated time the relationship, but nonetheless I encourage you to contact me by, via email and I'll be happy to answer that question through the email. Another question that came in is, it's kind of two questions. One, they're asking if you're measuring in matrix, and the other is, are we measuring frequency? Hmm. Um, I believe by metric, uh, you mean the metric uh, measurement systems, yes. Uh, we provide depth in meters uh, or fraction of a meters, and um, the 
information about the bottom type. It's either provided as binary information, whether it's sand, seagrass, or algae. And in terms of water clarity, uh, we haven't quite decided yet how to present it, but any information will be provided in metric system. And I must admit, I do not really understand, understand the question about measuring frequency. Uh, it could be related to how often we can uh, acquire new data over a certain image. Uh, typically, our revisit time is about three days. And if uh, we are fortunate with the weather, we can derive, again, the water depth at uh, typically uh, three-day revisit time. The next question that came in is the listener is asking, what are some of the applications that researchers have been interested in using this data for? From the perspective of research, the depth is very important. The depth and uh, bottom characteristics are very important to monitor environmental changes. Um, I recently talked with uh, researchers from the Queensland University in Brisbane who monitor uh, seagrass population in Moreton Bay. The same problem occurs for areas close to Florida where there is a substantial degradation in seagrass population and it's very important for, uh, for the fish habitat. Now, uh, we can predict, as well as we can predict the bottom depth, we can also predict uh, information about the changes in the benthic habitat. Uh, we also can provide information about the water clarity. Uh, there was an area in uh, Solomon, Solomon Islands uh, between New Zealand and Australia uh, in the tropical region, which um, underwent a tremendous earthquake and the entire uh, coral reef uh, subdued by about one meter. And we can very easily see that from the imagery and just as well we can probably um, compute the water depth. Now this is purely re for research perspective and from commercial perspective the depth has probably some different applications. The next question for you is what is the basic assumption on your geometric photometric approach when deriving bathymetry apart from the relationship with atmospheric factors? Uh, the basic assumption is the knowledge of refraction through the water. And uh, the angles uh, of the refracted ray, rays how they compare with the incoming ray in the water, and this is based on Snellet uh, refraction law. Uh, the coefficients which drive the refraction through the water are well known, and for uh, typical waters are about uh, 1.34, uh, I believe. They vary slightly with salinity and temperature, but the errors due to the changes in temperature and due to the changes in salinity are probably very small. And the fundamental principle that guides the stereophotogrammetric approach is the same as is being used in um, derivation of height of buildings or elevation terrain. Uh, the next question that comes in, there's a couple of parts to it. Uh, they're asking, what would be needed to apply this technology in determining the symmetry of a large river reaches that may be more turbid? Uh, they're also asking, what would have to be changed as the listener is interested in bar development and changes in the river and migration? And the third part of their question is, how does this compare with LIDAR? Uh, well, let me uh, answer these individual pieces in, in three different steps. Uh, so the first question is what would be needed to apply this technology uh, to determine depth of uh, large river ridges that can be turbid. Uh, this research is already underway and I'll be happy to refer you to the University of Wyoming in Laramie who has done extensive studies of uh, Soda Butte Creek as well as Snake River in um, Grand Tetons and the Yellowstone National Park. 
Uh, the water depths uh, range anywhere from centimeters to about two meters, and the clarity varied uh, very tremendously. And I know that his research uh, matches very, his results using well V2 bathymetry match very well uh, the grand data truth which he acquired. And it's exactly the same technology which I presented so far. I do not know, however, how much he relied on the previous in situ knowledge of the uh, water clarity. That's probably a factor that is certainly different uh, than for uh, uh, than for, for the sea or for the oceans, mainly because of chlorophyll concentration. Now, the second question, what would have to be changed? And I do believe that nothing needs to be changed other than probably the better prior knowledge of what the water clarity, the ranges of the different parameters that describe the water clarity. And the third question is, if I'm, in, I'm interested in bar development and changes in the river migration. How does this compare with LIDAR? The accuracy of LIDAR is much better than satellite-derived technology, uh, partly because we don't have 800 kilometers distance from the LIDAR. It's only probably about two or three kilometers distance. Uh, LIDAR is more accurate. The accuracy of LIDAR is about uh, 15 centimeters. However, LiDAR is also very susceptible to uh, water clarity. And accuracy of LiDARs will go down with increased water turbidity. Maybe not in the same rate as satellite-derived technology. Nonetheless, it will go down. Now, the main reason for uh, proposing satellite-derived technology is maybe not to uh, be as good as LiDAR, which we probably will never be able, but provide a very good assessment uh, for a very cheap cost a very, and very quickly. And this is probably the greatest asset of satellite-derived technology. So the next question that comes in for you, Gregory, is a listener is asking, how does digital globe bathymetry compare with other commercial solutions? The, our technology is not very different from our existing technologies if we utilize the spectral matching. Uh, there is only one, law, there is one set of law of, law of physics which we all follow, and we have the same limitations. Uh, I can only speak to results that are published in open literature, and we perform, in some cases, much better, in some cases, somewhat worse than uh, published literature. In general, uh, there are only two or about three uh, commercial companies that sell bathymetry and uh, with well V2 data, and uh, we have very comparable results. The advantage uh, that you might get from uh, World V2, from Digital Globe directly, is currently the better acquisition, the better uh, we can control the acquisition parameters much better and also we are proposing the stereo approach. So what is the cost to obtain depth charts for a specific area? Now, the, the costs vary, and uh, we are currently proposing a low-cost solution to any interested parties, and uh, we have so-called uh, an alpha program where every user can obtain our data for uh, reduced price. Uh, the price is a factor, an order of magnitude smaller than LiDAR data, and it's probably as much as 20 times smaller than the cost of multi-beam sounding. It's a very low-cost solution. Uh, we charge uh, per water pixel, and there is minimum price for every order. And I'll be happy to present uh, the pricing quote uh, upon email request. Another listener is asking, once the imagery is available, how long does it take to create a product? It takes literally one day to create the product, but it takes us about four days to perform quality assessment of a product. 
Um, but deriving bathymetry is very tricky, and again, it's susceptible to uh, many different factors. And in order to provide the best quality, uh, we would like to spend about four, currently four days to get as good as accuracy as we, as we have. But again, the bottom line, uh, we can generate a product in about five working days. I'm going to take a couple more questions before we wrap up today's webinar. The question that came in from a listener is, they're asking, has Digital Globe performed validation on other parts of the world, including more turbid waters? Yes, we have. Uh, we have performed validation in uh, the Persian Gulf. Uh, we also did in uh, Western Australia. Uh, the Western Australia is a very difficult area, uh, dominated, maybe not dominated, but uh, frequent, um, with very dark uh, algae. And the retrieval quality degrades uh, with the brightness of the bottom. The darker the bottom, the worse uh, quality we have. Uh, we haven't put it in the validation report in our compendium as we're still about validating the approach. Um, in order to validate, we would like to get access to relatively rich validation data set as well as relatively recent. Uh, however, the future compendium will release information about the validation in our sites, including more turbid waters. And our last question of the day that came from a listener is, Gregory, they're asking, how soon will we provide a stereo solution? Now, the first part uh, of the stereo product uh, will be validation. And I expect the validation to be done probably by the end of this year. And depending on the results, if the results are promising, uh, we are probably going to market uh, the stereo approach as soon as the beginning of the next year. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, we have we have very good indication that it's going to be a viable product. Nonetheless, uh, we have to validate it first. So that's going to conclude the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, I'd like to thank Gregory again for his informative presentation. If you would like more information or if you have additional questions for Gregory, please feel free to contact him directly. Gregory's email information is provided on the slide. Thank you again for attending today's webinar, and we hope to see you at future events.